did you expect that from George? I mean, that dominant or anywhere close to it? No, I, I thought maybe like a two touchdown margin. I, to me, what it was a reminder of, and maybe we should have predicted this, but it was a reminder of how good Georgia can be when it when it turns it up. If we think of some of their biggest moments in the season, you go back to the season opener against Oregon. They, they absolutely pasted them. Well, that was Georgia's last ranked opponent, Oregon, until they played Tennessee uh, at the beginning of November. They had they didn't play any ranked opponents in, bet- in between. Well, what Georgia do then? They come out in the first half and they just crushed the balls. It was 24-6 at halftime. The game was over at the half. Um, Ohio State took them to the wire, to be sure. I think that was a reflection of the fact that pure talent-wise, Ohio State had one of the one of the best rosters in the country. It's why most of us thought Ohio State – was a preseason candidate to win the national championship. It's why most of us expected Ohio State to be in the college football playoff coming into this season. Uh, Ohio State, you know, talent for talent, is one of the few programs that could go up against Georgia, and we saw that play out, I think, in that semifinal. Talent for talent, TCU couldn't go up against Georgia. Didn't mean I thought it was going to be a blowout to this extent, but, boy, I mean, you, you really saw the discrepancy, I thought, Um, play out on the field throughout four quarters. And and again, I also think you saw what Georgia can do in those moments where it plays up to its top level. We didn't always see that this, this season as, as dominant as Georgia was at times, they did let off the accelerator um, in a few games in a few moments of games. They didn't let off the accelerator at all on, on Monday. They, they kept it pressed to the floor. You wrote a column that I thought was really good and uh, great minds think alike because I was about to read the, I was about to write the same thing, and I read yours. I was like, well, so much for that. Uh, (laughs) Because I didn't want to look like I was copying you, frankly. Uh, But there are people that are going to hate Georgia that are Tennessee fans just because you hate Georgia. And I get that. But as far as an analytical look at Georgia being dominant, does that help the SEC does it just make them stronger in recruiting? This debate's been going on for decades. Um, but what are your thoughts as as far as um, Georgia and their dominance right now? Does it kind of raise all waters, or does it just make it tougher for other schools to compete against them in recruiting or both? Well, you can always feel free to write columns that I write. Uh, we're, we're in a copycat industry, right? So, so go, go, go right ahead anytime I, you like. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I mean, it was, my idea was so close to yours. I was like, well, it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, we like you know we, around the SEC, we we see some some best, uh, chest thumping sometimes. Uh, the, the SEC, SEC. I, I don't really know how George's success uplifts the Vols, uplifts Alabama, uplifts really many other programs, if any, in in the SEC. I mean, if you want to have conference pride and say, yeah, someone from our conference uh, won the national championship, go right ahead, I I guess. I don't know how that helps your program, but go right ahead and feel that conference pride. But no, I don't think Georgia's dominance in the sport um, does anything to help Tennessee. I think what helps Tennessee is they have a competent coach right now and Josh Heupel, who's done a really nice job, um, he's he's done good for quarterback development, something they sorely needed on the heels of the Jeremy Pruitt tenure, um, helped develop Hendon Hooker into a, a Heisman Trophy, well, should have been a Heisman Trophy finalist, even though he wasn't. Um, so that's what helps Tennessee. You know, Georgia winning a, a national championship, I don't think that that does anything for, for Tennessee, uh, doesn't necessarily ruin Tennessee's future. But I think if you're Tennessee, you would rather Georgia be three and nine right now <laughs> going into the offseason, because if they were, you'd probably be plucking a lot more kids out of the state of Georgia uh, headed to your program because who would want to play for Georgia if the Bulldogs are three and nine. So, no, I, I, don't, I don't think Georgia uh, being the two time national champion, um, you know, there, there should be a lot of people around the SEC in, in Knoxville or Nashville or T- Tuscaloosa uh, celebrating that. Oh, Caleb. Sorry, muted. sorry, was muted. Uh, like, I wanted to add on that a little bit because, you know, we've been talking a lot here about how Tennessee, be, how significant it was for Tennessee to beat Clemson in the Orange Bowl because, you know, they've competed for a lot of recruits. I've said, and I've told Dave, I don't think, I don't think the college football world is big enough for Clemson and Tennessee to both be powerhouses. I'll take it a, te- I'll take it a step further. I don't know if, I, you're right, Tennessee's in great shape because they have a competent coach right now. 
it's going to be really hard for them to get the, to the level the fans expect them to be at if Georgia and Alabama remain this dominant and Clemson is a powerhouse. I mean, you're really icing out so many areas Tennessee needs to get talent when that happens. Yeah, I, I think I'd buy that. And, and I think if you look back to sort of the peak of Tennessee football, uh, at least, I guess, during our lifetimes, um, you know, you go back to the to the 90s and early 2000s and Georgia was not functioning you know, anywhere close in, in the way that, that they are now. It, Georgia wasn't even functioning um, to the level that they were at times during the, the height of the Mark Richt era. So, yeah, I mean, when, when Tennessee was thriving at its peak, Georgia was not a player in the sport in the, in the way that it is now. And, and I think uh, in the way that many people thought that they, they should be. It took Georgia uh, a long time to get to the level um, that I think many thought that Georgia could reach um, and, and really Kirby Smart has only unlocked. But true, and I, and I think there are only so many athletes to, to go around. I think that's, that's true in all parts of the country, uh, particularly here where you're, you know, you're a little bit farther from the, the Texas recruits. You don't have as, as easy as access uh, to that state. So you need, to, you, know, you need to be doing well in the recruiting footprint in the state of Georgia throughout the southeast and uh, as you say, if all those programs are functioning at their that they're high at their highest, it makes it hard to squeeze in and, and wreck that party. Uh, another column that you wrote more recently, and it's it's on his uh, Twitter page, and you can follow him very easily at uh, B Topmeyer T O P P M E Y E R for some great stuff. Fuel to our tank is how you led the tweet, and. One of those uh, additions of fuel to the tank was Tennessee being number one in the college football uh, rankings, and that was uh, way back when, the first ranking. But but also, I, I'd like for you to address that, but just in how Kirby Smart is just a master, a, a lot like I think of Bill Belichick or maybe a Nick Saban, of how you are the underdog in every game you go into, which in the end is just a big, bold face lie. Yeah, it's like it started with a, a morsel of truth and then it just became this, uh, as, as you said, this colossal lie, really. Um, it is true that Georgia was not expected to win the national championship this season. In, in most circles, uh, many of us thought it would be uh, Alabama or Ohio State, myself included. It is true that many of us expected Georgia would take at least a small step back after sending 15 guys to the NFL draft last spring. So those things are true. Now, this idea that Georgia is some plucky underdog story, that they were out there proving naysayers wrong all year. I mean, they still came into the season ranked preseason number three, right? It's not like uh, everybody was saying Georgia was going to be hot garbage this year after losing so much talent. We all knew they had a new wave of talent coming in it's just most of us thought that they would take a step back after sending so many guys to the nfl and they and they really didn't um you know i think i think a lot of us thought oh, maybe 10 and 2 11 and 1 somewhere in there might be might be fighting to get to get a playoff spot so most of us expected georgia would would still be good but kirby somehow got his team to believe that everybody was out there doubting georgia now there were some things that helped kirby get his team to believe that. And I do think one of them was Tennessee being number one in the first college football playoff rankings. Now, if you would have looked at the sports books, they would have told you Georgia was still a nine point favorite in that game. But, you know, for all the talk about gambling we have now, I still think the rankings to the athletes mean a lot. Um, I think the athletes look at those rankings um, and they take those to heart. You know, I mean, Jamin Dumas Johnson, uh, the Georgia linebacker, after the game said it was pretty crazy to see that people would think we would lose in our own home. He's talking about that Tennessee game. Now, again, if you look at the betting spread, well, the, that didn't necessarily indicate that that many people thought Georgia would lose in its own home, but there was that number one next to the Tennessee name. And, and I do think that served as, as a motivator. Uh, Keely Ringo told me that it was quote fuel to our tank uh, to see Tennessee ranked Number one. Now, there was not really a lot of, um, you know, ridiculing of Tennessee. You didn't hear the Georgia players say after the national championship that, oh, that was a joke that the balls were ranked number one or anything like that. It was more they noticed it. They took it to heart. Um, they heard the whispers. 
that maybe they were vulnerable going into that game. They were playing the number one ranked offense and they came out and crushed Tennessee. And it, and it does sound like that that ranking um, did serve as, as part of their motivation. Yeah. And I don't see any sign of that ending. I just, uh, Kirby smart to me feels like um, an absolute long-term coach like Nick Saban. I just, you know, Nick Saban did get, he, he didn't like, living in Louisiana, so he went to the Dolphins. But Kirby Smart being a Georgia guy, the fact that um, I, I, the, the money is much more equal way back in the day when, when you guys were still in high school, I can remember that NFL coaches made millions, and I, I, I was around at the point where an assistant coach in the SEC made 75000 without a, a, even a two-year guarantee. So, I mean, that – to me, the money has changed things where I view, I don't know about you, Blake, but I, I want to get your take. I view a great head coaching job or even assistant coaching job in college as being equal, not less than the NFL. You? Depends how much you like recruiting. Depends how much you like dealing with NIL and boosters in that world. Uh, I mean, you got to deal with, with some of that in the NFL. It's just different. Your boosters are called your owner in the NFL, right? I mean, these college coaches that act like it's it's crazy that they would have to be influenced in any way by booster money. It's like, okay, well then go to the NFL where some rich guy owns the team um, and, and you still have to answer to him, right? So, yeah, I mean, it depends which, which one you want to dance with. Do you want to deal with the NIL and the boosters? Do you want to deal with uh, some rich guy owning the team? Do you want to recruit um, and, and have recruiting be a 24-7, 365 thing? Do you want it to be more the draft and free agency? So I, I think that's what it comes down to. If you don't mind the recruiting and if you don't mind the way NIL has, has influenced the sport, then, yeah, I would agree um, college football can be as good, if not better, of a job than the NFL. I mean, you know, the buyouts, the long-tenured contracts, the raises guys can get at certain programs for going seven and five. Um, I mean, it's kind of laughable. You know, Eli Drinkwitz went six and seven this year. Uh, he's worse than his predecessor, Barry Odom, was talking about the Missouri coach. He gets a raise. He gets an extension. Uh, he's now making six million dollars uh, annually. I mean, what kind of world are, are we living in where the Missouri coach who goes six and seven gets a raise to six million dollars? But that's college football now. And although, you know, most of these coaches and administrators would would make you believe that they're poppers. And that NIL is straight, sending them straight to the poorhouse. Um, we're still seeing these mega deals um, and, and oftentimes mega deals for mediocre coaches. So it is a great gig um, if you can handle the lifestyle, um, if you can handle the recruiting, and if you're comfortable with, with the way, uh, as I said, NIL dollars uh, are, are influencing the sport, in particular the, the recruiting in the transfer space. Blake, I want to ask that question from the reverse, funny enough. Um, I think we're not far off from the, from people finally realizing in terms of market value that it's worth more to, it's worth spending more on a college coach than an NFL coach because I feel like a college coach brings a lot more a college head coach brings a lot more value to the program. The program is so dependent on who the coach is at the time. Whereas if you're loaded with talent in the NFL, you can kind of recycle some coaches. And if you have no talent, it really doesn't matter who you have in the NFL. It's all about, you know, you got to have a GM who can draft, things like that. I mean, you know, the Cowboys fired Jimmy Johnson and won a Super Bowl two years later with Barry Switzer, who had not coached ever in the NFL and hadn't coached in 10 years when he took over the, the team. So I, I feel like, do you think we're going to hit a point where the bigger programs in college football realize – they should be spending more on coaches and even the NFL teams too. Yeah. It seems like we're kind of already headed down that space. And, and when your workforce is unpaid, it allows you to, to spend uh, really kind of crazy money on coaches if you want to. Now, some of these coaches, uh, I think you could make the case are worth more than what they're making. Others, like I said, they get rewarded for a six and seven season with an extension in, in a race. Um, but a lot of this is a, a byproduct of you have an unpaid workforce. Um, and so when you don't pay your workforce, um, you can spend the big bucks on the coaches and the administrators and the staff, uh, the assistants, the, the whole bit. And, and also like nap pods, um, you know, a lot of college, college programs have better facilities than NFL teams do. Why is that? 
Um, it's not because the NFL doesn't care about the product. It's because the NFL has to pay its workforce um, and college does, does not. But I think to your, your larger point of, of it, you know, in some ways more being asked of college coaches, I think it's true. And it's always been the case a little bit that, that a college coach was kind of a combination of a coach plus a general manager. But I think it's more true now than ever with the importance of transfers and how you have to work the transfer portal. I mean, it was used to be kind of a two-step process before. You had to be able to identify talent and recruit, and then you had to be able to coach slash develop talent. Now, I think it's almost a three-pronged effect. You have to be able to recruit and develop. You have to be able to coach X's and O's a little bit, and you have to be able to work the free agency, uh, the transfer portal, like a general manager. So I do think you know there are more spokes on the, on the wheel now. Um, I don't know that the college game asks coaches to be as savvy on the X's and O's front as I think NFL asks coaches to be. I think I think uh, greatness in college is mostly achieved by talent assembly. I think Kirby Smart's a good coach. Uh, I think Nick Saban's a great coach. I also don't think it's a coincidence that these guys are are racking up national titles uh, because they've assembled the most talent. Um, and so I do think that, um, you know, as I said, I think, I think the NFL, uh, can uplift those X's and O's guys a little bit more than the college game can. And, and, and college coaching by and large is about getting the best Jimmy's and Joe's and about developing those guys. And, and Kirby smart's been really good at doing that. Blake turning to Tennessee got about midway through the season when Tennessee was, was probably going to win 10 games. And I thought to myself, uh oh, expectations are going to get out of whack, and this could be a potential problem in 2023. And then I looked at the schedule. Tennessee could win 10 games fairly easily this upcoming season. And um, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's asking too much of this volunteer program, even for the most optimistic fans. I, I think 10 wins is possible again. I did too. And I was uh, along a similar thinking you were like in the back of my head, I was thinking like, ah, they'll go eight and four next year. I, I still have concerns about the defense. They're losing him and hooker. You know, I, I know Joe Milton played well in, in the orange bowl, but I, I still think it's a big ask for him to play at the level Hinton hooker did this year. So I, I, I initially was thinking, yeah, they're going to regress to like eight and four next year. And then you look at the schedule <laughs> and you can start talking yourself into 10 and two. I mean, um, yeah, I don't want to say the schedule is a, a joke because then you look at Georgia's schedule and I mean, what, who do they have on their schedule? The, the toughest power five on Georgia's schedule next year is Georgia Tech, a program that has not played like a power five program for most of the last few seasons. Um, so there's, there's plenty of that to go around, I think in the SEC, but yes, Tennessee does have a, a certainly manageable schedule. You look at their crossovers, they always have Alabama. Um, their other crossover is Texas A&M, who I think will be better. Um, and yet, Texas A&M has to come to Neyland Stadium. So I think that's advantageous. You look at the non-conference schedule, uh, Tennessee ducked BYU, uh, the road game there. They're going to be playing Virginia in the neutral site instead. I think that's you know obviously a game Tennessee should win. I mean, I say neutral site. It's going to be in Nashville. It's not really a neutral site for Virginia, right? Um, so the non-conference schedule – positions Tennessee to be 4-0, um, you know, before before we even start looking at SEC play. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the one concern you would have, though, is is there going to be that game where the defense costs you? Is there going to be that South Carolina game? I think this team uh, is going to remain vulnerable to that next season, um, whether it be a South Carolina. I don't know. That game will be in Knoxville next year. That helps. Um, but I do think they're going to remain vulnerable to that. And so if that happens, you know, to get to 10 and two, you would have to steal one against Alabama or Georgia again. Don't know how often you can count on that. So you either have to get rid of that um, game where the defense falls flat and allows 60 plus points and you're not losing to the likes of a South Carolina, uh, or you have to avoid that from, from costing you any games in the, in the games you quote unquote should win. Uh, and then you go out and you go 10 and two with losses to, to Alabama and Georgia.